There we go. Hello everyone, welcome. We're doing an interview with uh, Chris from Grinding Gear Games today. Um, why don't you introduce yourself, Chris? Uh, my name is Chris Wilson. I'm the producer and lead designer on Path of Exile. I was one of the four founders of the company when we started Grinding Gear Games back in 2006. All right. So, um, for the people who've never heard about Path of Exile, why don't you tell us a little about the game? Basically, Path of Exile is an online action RPG. We like to think of it as the uh, Battle.net component of Diablo 2, as you will. So basically, it's set in a dark fantasy world. We're going for quite a visceral gothic horror vibe. You know, lots of blood, lots of gore. You know, no cartoony rainbows, for example. And people play on our secure online servers, accumulating wealth and killing monsters, much like other action RPGs. We've been working on it for almost five years now. It's in closed beta, and we're gradually expanding the pool of people who get access. All right. So, uh, what sets it apart from other action RPGs? The most important characteristic that we see is the fact that it's played online, which means that people's items that they find and various achievements that they get are stored permanently in a way that other players know that they haven't cheated to get them. Um, in terms of actual gameplay mechanics, we've put a lot of effort into trying to really push the itemization of things. For example, the active skills in the game are found on items, and various types of things that aren't commonly itemized so heavily in other games have been really pushed in Path of Exile. For example, the flasks can get mods on them that become part of your build and so on. So basically, there's a lot of loot to be, get, to be gotten? That's right. We really care about the loot, and we've tried very hard to make sure that it's as interesting as possible. All right. So, um, what about the game universe? What's the story about? So basically, the player character has been exiled from their home continent to this dark and foreboding, um, like forsaken wasteland of a continent called Ryklast. They basically wake up on a beach with no possessions in a very hostile situation where there are zombies coming to attack them. And they have to make their way through this world, accumulating what they can to stay alive uh, playing with or against other players in an effort to try to work out what's going on that caused this continent to get destroyed in the first place. All right. So, um, when's the game coming out? Like, when's it done? Well, we have a 10-year plan for the game in terms of the content that we'd like to add for it, so it's difficult to say when it will be done. But our intention is that we'll enter open data early next year, you know, maybe January or February. And at that stage, we expect the game will be accessible to anyone who would like to play and will continue to add content. Um, we're not certain at what point we'll say the game is released. It's difficult to define when a release is, given that open beta is often seen as a soft release for many games of this type. All right. Um, so how be uh, so the game's going to be free to play, right? That's right. We're, it's free in that you don't have to pay any money to see any of the content. But we're being very careful to not use the term free to play that many other companies are using, where you essentially have onerous microtransactions. Our microtransactions are very um, ethical in that we're only selling cosmetic things, things that increase how you look in the game. For example, alternate skill effects dyes, cosmetic pets, that type of thing that doesn't actually mean that you can kill monsters more efficiently. For example, if you upgrade your fireball skill to have a new graphic, it looks really awesome and people respect you for it, but it doesn't actually change the speed that you kill monsters. And we're doing this for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because it's a small indie developer from New Zealand, we have to do what we can to get a large amount of players interested, and that means not taking the unethical route to double the revenue per user. And of course, the other reason is because we really want to push competitive PvP, it would be quite unfair if players could just buy their way into success there. So you're telling me I won't be able to buy some epic loot, some some great sword or something? Unfortunately not. You'll have to earn it or trade for it in the game. Bah. I know, hard work. <laughs> <laughs> right, so how will PvP work? I mean, PvP hasn't really been a big element in other action RPGs. So how will it work in Path of Exile? We really respect good competitive PvP. We've been doing what we can to make sure that there are lots of viable modes in the game. One of them that we're 
going to be testing relatively soon is cutthroat mode, which is basically like, um, you could say it's an open world PvP mode where you can kill people and take their stuff. And although we only expect that about 5% of players will really care to play in that game mode long term, it should be pretty interesting. Other stuff we're adding soon are some PvP arenas where you can get three friends and play against other teams of three. And over time we anticipate adding other modes such as proper organized large scale tournaments. All right. There was some news recently in about uh, Diablo 3 that the PvP in Hardcore won't actually be Hardcore. What about Path of Exile? Will you permadie in PvP? Wow, I had heard that news actually. That's quite a, that's kind of interesting. We're undecided and I suspect we'll probably support both. A lot of people feel the attraction of Hardcore PvP is the thrill of losing their character. Though I'm sure people would also want to test their builds in a PvP situation. So I suspect we'll eventually support both modes and go with what the players want. All right. So you uh, mentioned leagues earlier. What's a league? So basically a league is like an alternate game mode that has, think of it like a pseudo game server where everyone's stuff is segregated from the rest of the world. So for example, hardcore mode is a league. If you have stuff in hardcore, you don't have it in the non-hardcore mode. And we can create these leagues for short durations, um, you know, on on demand basically. For example, a couple of times now in the beta we've had three or four hour leagues that we've run where people can play, compete on a certain ladder, and then afterwards their characters are moved back to the normal league. We're trying to do this to keep the game interesting so that people who enjoy the thrill of actually leveling up quickly and competing with other people can get that feeling very often rather than just on extremely rare um, times that will add a new ladder. All right. Yeah, that usually only happens with ladder resets and that kind of stuff in Diablo. Uh, so, will these race leagues be a, a frequent thing? We'd like to run them pretty frequently. I mean, we anticipate that some of the players are going to specialize in racing extremely well against other players, just like there will be people who prefer PvP, and there will be people who like the, the wealth grind of PvE. So we'll try to run the race leagues relatively frequently. Basically, depends how many players we get that are interested. So I suspect it wouldn't be unreasonable to expect a couple a week, at least eventually, in terms of opportunities for players to compete um, racing to the top. All right. So what's the level cap? The level cap is 100, but we have harsh diminishing returns approaching it. It's relatively similar to how it was in Diablo 2 in that respect. We want players to be able to play to a relatively powerful level pretty easily. You know, within a few long days of playing, they can get to level 60 or whatever. But after that, it starts to tail off and become a lot slower. This is good because it means that players don't have to grind for years to see the higher content, but that players that do want to spend years of grinding have a way of comparing themselves in that they're still gaining levels after quite a long time. You know, level 90 is incredibly impressive, and level 91 is even harder. So if you see someone who's level 95, it shows that they've spent a very, very long time playing the game. All right. About how long do you think it'll take to reach level 100? I would prefer it if people couldn't reach level 100 very easily. So we'll probably pitch it that getting to the low 90s is an extremely large task that takes a lot of time from people who don't do anything else. And then if they find some abusive way to level, maybe they'll get a bit higher. But it would be great if they still have levels to gain on their first characters after several years of playing. All right. So what about like end game content? What, what do you do when you've played through the game? So this type of game generally has difficulty levels where you repeat the game again on a higher difficulty. Now, as for what happens when you've finished all of the difficulty levels, this is something that's quite hotly debated. We've tried a few options. Um, our initial idea was that we would have some final difficulty level that was all static in level so that you know it, it's just higher, harder than everything else and the player has to work a long time to get the items available to even be able to compete in that difficulty. By making it all the same level we were hoping that players would be able to see all of the game content in the end game. You know, they wouldn't be forced to just play one particular boss encounter over and over. So no, no, no bail runs? Yeah, we, we were trying to avoid having 3% of our content repeated by 90% of the players. Unfortunately, when we tested this on our alpha servers, we found that on the final difficulty level, players would just play in the easy area, you know, whichever area it was. Uh, initially it was the mud flats, then it was the ledge. Basically places that had an easy assortment of monsters that they could abuse. So we gradually added more difficulty into each area until the game was beginning to feel a little homogenous. You know, all the areas end up having the same kind of balance of ranged monsters and fast monsters and so on, taking away their character. So we decided to rethink it a bit. And that's why our experimental endgame at the moment 
consists of what we call the maelstrom of chaos areas. Now, this concept may not stay around, but it's what we're running with for now, where basically these are 20 areas at the end of the game that are very hard, and they're basically completely randomly picked from a set of different types of areas they can be, so you never know what you're going to expect. You can't purposefully force an area with easy non-ranged guys. You get quite a random assortment of monsters. The, the idea here being that you have to build a relatively generalist character, and you can't just make an an abusive one that can level in the same area for years on end. Alright. So, um... How much of the content is in the beta right now, compared to what will be in the final version? Or, well, the release or open beta or whatever you want to call it. So, in the game at the moment we have two acts, neither of which are completely finished. There are some quests missing from Act 2, including the end of the act, so we're working on that at the moment. We anticipate having Act 3 ready by the time we go into open beta. So at that stage the game will have three acts, and we feel that that's a reasonable amount of content that we're happy to call the game you know, a playable state that we're willing to let a lot of people loose on. However, we intend to add more content, you know, an act every four to six months if possible after release. So it could well be that within several years the game has six or seven or eight acts, um, if we can get that much content in there. And in addition, we'd like to add other things like guild content or other types of expansions that increase the game horizontally as well as vertically. Alright. Will these uh, expansions also be free to play, or do you have uh, any plans of monetizing them? All of the expansions and content will always be free. The player, A player who does not want to buy any aesthetic stuff can still play the game with equal rights uh, alongside all the other players. It's just that they're not going to look quite as awesome as the ones who have paid a bit of money. Alright. You talked a bit about the, game, uh, the gem system earlier. Could you elaborate on that a bit? So we've itemized our skills on a set of gems that the player can find or be awarded with when they complete quests. Basically there are skill gems and support gems, and these level up as you gain experience. So for example, if I take a fireball skill gem and I put it in my wand, I'm now able to cast fireballs, and as I progress through the game, the fireball gem gains experience and gets more powerful. But if this gem was a particularly rare one, I could level it up a bit and then trade it for another player, because the only way that he can get the gem is by either finding it, which is very difficult, or by trading for it. The interesting thing with the system is that the support gems allow you to modify the characteristics of a gem that you have. An example would be, if I take my fireball gem and support it with multiple projectiles, I'm now able to cast multiple fireballs at the same time. We have some pretty neat gems coming in the near future that make this even more interesting. For example, the Trapify or Entrap support gem lets you make a trap version of whatever skill it is that you've bound it to. An example is if I take my multiple fireballs thing that I just described, put Trapify next to it, now I have the ability to lay multiple fireball traps that trigger when monsters get near them. So we're looking at adding a, a set of interesting support gems to further make the system quite a lot more complicated. Alright, so how does the um, customization work beyond the, the gems? What about classes? So we've got six classes in the game, of which five have been announced. And as you know, the system has quite a lot of versatility. You, all classes are on the same passive tree, and they can all use the same gems if they specialize. Now, we feel that the class identity in the game at the moment is not pushed as hard as it could be. The character classes maybe don't feel quite distinct enough from each other, which is some of the feedback that we've been receiving. So part of our redesign that we're doing for this next big patch is pushing the classes to feel somewhat different from each other. Sure, they can still use each other's skills if they have a particular combo reason to do so, but we're really trying to make the Marauders feel tanky and the Witches feel like glass cannons, for example. Alright, so... Uh... What about the passive skill tree? How does that work? So the passive skill tree currently has 750 nodes laid out like, some people call it the passive skill forest. It's, I mean, there are pictures of it online, but it's a large set of interconnected nodes where each one can take one point. In the version we currently have online, everyone starts in the center and is encouraged to go in the direction of their class, but they can go in any direction they want to if there's a good reason to. For example, we've put some pretty tempting skills at low levels for the other attributes, you know, fast run speed or attack speed and dexterity, or decent boosts to life or physical damage in the strength area, for example. Our intention is that we actually try pulling this out so that each class starts at a different location in the tree, which will let the classes have quite a lot more uh, distinctiveness, as I mentioned before. So when we do our big update that increases, um, well, that pulls all the classes to their own areas, we'll use it as an opportunity to further increase the amount of passives in that tree, so there are even more options for players. 
The chat's going a bit nuts here. Did you say 750 skill points? That's right, there are currently 750 passive skills on the tree that people can pick from. Um, it's worth noting that you only put one point in each. So for example, increased axe damage, there are probably going to be 10 or 20 things like that. Not quite the same, you know, some of them have higher numbers than others and some of them add speed or whatever at the same time. But yeah, there are 750 and you're getting one point per level, so you can only specialize in a small fraction of the tree at any one time. All right. With that many skill points to allocate, uh, will there be respects? Respect is a sticky issue with this type of game, and we've had a lot of feedback on it. But we honestly feel that part of the fun of playing this game is actually building a character. So if I make a bow character and I play through for 50 levels, and then I want to play an axe character, the correct thing to do should be to play an axe character from the beginning of the game again, rather than change my bow character into an axe character and skip the game's content. However, we understand that players either make mistakes or click on the wrong thing, or try something out that they want to undo. So we're going to allow people small-scale respects. They have the ability Sorry, they will have the ability to change a few points at a time occasionally. Or if they find some items that enable them to change points, they can make a medium scale respect to their character, but it's going to cost them a fair amount of trading in game to get the, those items. Our, our purpose here basically is that if it's a large change you want to make, it's better to actually play a new character through. Though I could imagine if someone's been playing for two years to level like 95 or something like that, and they want to change their character, they could decide it's worth the grind of getting the items to do it, rather than um, starting a new character to play to 95 again. Okay. One other aspect of that is that it's relatively fast to level a character up to medium levels. I mean, if you play to level 40 and you don't like the character, you can just make another one relatively easily. You know, it's not its not like a large-scale MMORPG where your character is with you for several months. All right. So uh, how does grouping work? Will there be uh, support classes or... Like, like healers, support. for example, or bards or whatever? So it's common in online MMORPGs that you have healers and tank roles. However, because this is an action RPG, we've designed all of the character classes to be focused around damage output. Now, there are support roles that you can play. If you build a character that has, you know, an example is um, auras or scouts that affect your teammates, and you choose to use those rather than damaging skills, then you are able to support other players. But each of the core classes has a way of doing damage that's hopefully equivalent to the other classes, just somewhat different. You know, whether it's area of effect damage from a distance or close-up melee damage. So we haven't built the classes as support and healer roles, but we're making sure there are some options there. Though this means, of course, that every class has the ability to heal itself, either with potions or with skills or life leech, for example, and hence it would be very uncommon for someone to build a character whose entire purpose is just providing additional healing. All right, that makes sense. Especially in the absence of any healing skills at the moment. Okay. So uh, the currency system is kind of odd. Could you explain that? We felt that with online action RPGs, people aren't actually using gold for what it's meant to be used for. They just use it as a way of repairing items, buying some potions, resurrecting their mercenaries, that type of thing. Basically just gold sinks. And the actual piles of gold that they accumulate themselves aren't really very useful. So we took a step back and said, well, all of these things like repairing your items and buying potions are things that we can work around in much better ways. For example, scrapping durability as just a negative gameplay thing that we don't like, and replacing potions with flasks that recharge in combat for better gameplay experience. And after taking away these obvious gold sinks and acknowledging that players often prefer to trade item for item in this type of game where gold is often worthless, we realized we can actually make do without gold. So we designed a tiered set of currency items in the game. The simplest of these, for example, are Scrolls of Wisdom, and they get more complicated. Items that add mods to blue items, or items that upgrade to rare, or add mods to those. And we designed, I think it's 15 or 20 of these so far that we have, that we plan to add more, and set them to drop at various increasingly rare intervals as you play. The idea being that when someone finds the item, they have the ability to use it immediately to benefit their character, or to save it up to trade to another player or give to another character. And this has worked remarkably successfully so far. I mean, I was very worried that players would require some convincing to like the system, but so far I've had very good feedback. 
and players seem to really like it. Now, it's interesting, we don't even yet have the ability to sell your items to the vendors. Now, this is coming relatively soon, but people are still positive about the system, even though that major functionality is missing. So I see this as a big success in terms of that design. So how will selling work with this system? Basically, because we don't want to have anything that closely parallels gold, we don't intend to have it so that you go to the vendor and offload all your junk in one go and get a pile of currency items for each one. We're trying to make it more interesting. So an example is, you could take three blue items to the vendor and get a scroll of identification in return. Now this is useful because scroll of identifications are not particularly common in the game. You know, you do have to put a bit of work into ID or stuff, which is a you know a purposeful game mechanic. But throwing away some blue items you don't need in order to get the ability to ID what you do care about is an interesting trade-off. We can do the same thing, for example, with rares. As you play through the game, many people accumulate a stash full of rares that aren't quite good enough to trade to other players. And by allowing them to trade, for example, five or six of these to a vendor to get something that lets them create a new rare that they care about, that type of thing enables people to offload their excess stuff while still appearing like a kind of a bad deal on the surface. Having said that, people have enough junk lying around that they can often take these bad deals and make a profit from them. There are other interesting things we have planned, like items have an implicit amount of quality. So we could have a trade with the vendor where if you bring um, items with quality that sums over a certain threshold, he'll give you a certain type of item for that. And that means that although you can pick up white junk off the ground and take it to the vendor, you have to actually care about what the quality is and find high quality items to get any kind of benefit here. You can't just scoop up everything you see and truck it to town. That's pretty interesting. So it'll basically be like crafting recipes for selling. That's correct, yeah. We think of them as recipes, and we're trying to come up with enough interesting ones, as well as a few private ones that players can find over time, that it should mean that any deficiencies in what they can get are remedied by just picking things up to take to the vendor. You know, if it's hard to ID stuff at the moment, well, they can go and find some blue items and bring them to the vendor to ID the one they care about. All right. So what about non-combat? Will there be, like, professions or some kind of gathering or crafting or anything like that? I believe we don't have any concepts like that in the game at the moment. In terms of the crafting, we have the currency items allowing you to make whatever you'd like. For example, if you want a good bow, you can go and find the right base type of bow or trade for it, and then you can use currency items on it to upgrade the quality to maximum, and you can add some mods to it until you get the ones that you want and re-roll it if, you, if you're not happy with them. Then you can upgrade it to a rare item and put more mods on and re-roll it again. It takes a lot of currency items to make a great bow this way, but it's essentially allowing the players to craft without them having to choose, well, I'm a bowsmith and going through that kind of non-action RPG profession grind. All right, that's that's interesting. All right, I think we're pretty much done here. Um, uh, one last question. What made you interested in making a game like Path of Exile? Our founders were good friends before we started the project, and we were all in a situation where, you know, we had enough savings that we could get by working on a game for a few years. We all had interesting complementary skills. Jonathan and I were programmers, Eric was an artist, Brian had a lot of experience with professional game playing and design. So we decided, well, we can we can afford to spend a few years working on a project like this. I mean, we were such big fans of games like Titan Quest and Diablo Dungeon Siege. We thought we could do the genre a, a pretty good game of our own. All right, that's uh, interesting to see that you're, well, like making the game of your dreams, I guess, in a in a way. Yeah, we make what we want to play. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Anyway, I thought we'd open up to some uh, questions from the chat. Then. Just see if we can get any good ones. Can I has data key? <laughs> Why is timer so unfair? Why is timer so unfair? I can answer that if you'd like. Yeah, answer it. It's very difficult getting the timer fair. See, we've promised all along that the people who signed up right at the beginning would get access to the game. And one of the characteristics of a person like that is they come along in 2010, they like what they see, they make an account, and then they come back occasionally. And our analytics shows that people do return who have been to the site before, even though they're not necessarily signing in. So because of this, we have literally tens of thousands of people who enjoyed what they saw, they signed up for an account, they don't have multiple accounts on that IP, 
they just haven't logged in again. And they do check back occasionally. They read the news, they see what we announce, they click on the screenshots. You know, they care about the game, but they aren't actively posting on the forum. And I want these people to be part of the game. You know, I, these are people I intentionally would like to invite. And that's why whenever I see people complaining that yet another inactive has had a key waste on them, it's a bit sad because these people are actually real players as well. Many of them do join the game and then give great feedback. It's just that they happen to have not been active members of our own community over the last year. All right. So the answer is, it's actually not unfair, I guess. Yeah, that's how I'd like to answer it. Uh, all right. So some questions then. What's your uh, personal favorite aspect of the game right now? The thing that I enjoy most about it is the item grind. I just love feeling, getting an awesome item in the game, even though I've seen better items in development mode, and just getting a good item and upgrading it to the point where it's special, you know, it achieves a certain purpose for your character, and then showing it to other people and seeing the people who appreciate what it's for definitely appreciate the effort that went into making that particular item. And this is from a player's point of view, you know, when I'm actually playing the game to test it. So. The thing that I most enjoy myself is the item grind, and it's neat to see that other teammates enjoy other aspects of the game more. I mean, we, we joke that roughly half our company cares about their visceral action combat, and the other half cares about the item grind. So if we both achieve our goals, then it's going to be a game that's fun to play, and also fun to play for quite a long period of time. Okay. Um... How are you going to balance PvP with all the... Uh varied types of builds available? That's a very good question. With the rebalance we're doing for this new patch that we're working on, we've actually started with PvP scenarios in mind to try to get the class balance a lot, a lot more future-proofed with regard to PvP. Of course, I suspect that the question that you're actually asking is what happens when a character dominates PvP because of a good build. And there are a few ways of approaching this. The reactive way is to reduce whatever he's doing, but it is a problem if that compromises the PvE game as well. So it may be that the best solution is to add tools to the meta game that enable other players to deal with it. I mean, this is often seen in, for example, Magic the Gathering. If some guy makes a deck of cards that's especially powerful, rather than banning the powerful cards, the designers will often introduce new ones that let other players have an opportunity to beat that deck. And so you get interesting builds where, if, for example, in Path of Exile there was a glass cannon witch that was dealing a lot of damage, it was basically untouchable, then people might choose to add more chaos damage to their damage output, which bypasses the witch's energy shield and has a chance to stun it very easily. Alright. Um, will there be an auction house type system in the game? We haven't announced formally our plans for a trade system in the game, though we anticipate announcing it relatively soon. But I can say that it's not in the form of an auction house due to the way we're handling currency. However, I do feel that it will make trading very easy, and there will be website integration with the system, so that it will be easy for people to do those trades while they're not actually playing the game. Exactly how many different varieties of skill gems and support gems are there, and are there plans for more? I think at the moment we have 37 active skills in the game, and somewhere between 20 and 30 skill gems. We had anticipate having approximately 100 active skills by the time we were ready to call the game released. In terms of support gems, I definitely feel we can have quite a lot more interesting ones. So, yeah, I would say those numbers are at least going to double or triple over the coming months. Alright. Uh, how's the flask system going to work in PvP? The flask system is actually somewhat designed around PvP. See, we noticed an interesting thing with other games where, with regard to potions and PvP, in Diablo 2's ad hoc dueling that the communities have come up with, people basically disallow the ability to drink flasks. And it's kind of strange that the players have to police this rather than it being a game rule. Whereas in other games, like for example World of Warcraft, you're welcome to use a potion, but it costs gold and there's a large cooldown on it, so it's a strategic thing you can do very infrequently. Correct me if I'm wrong, of course, I haven't played World of Warcraft for years, but the way that we've designed our flask system is at the beginning of a PvP encounter, we can fill up your flasks, and then they don't refill during combat unless you know special things happen, like killing other players. This means that you only have a limited set of resources to use during that fight, and the build that you've chosen of your flasks is highly critical. For example, I could set all my flasks to be really large capacity health flasks with mods that increase the amount they hold. This would mean that I'm just a huge battery of life, which might be difficult for some opponents to deal with. Or I could set it up so that my flasks refill my mana extremely quickly and don't do so much towards my health. 
This means that I have the ability to have a huge damage output by spamming high damage skills, hoping to catch the opponent off guard and have them die before they even use their other flasks. So because there are many builds available here and you have a limited amount of charges at the beginning which doesn't regenerate, we expect that it will actually be relatively fair for PvP. Okay. Um, you're talking about the huge skill tree and how unique a character can become. But won't everybody just use cookie cutter builds? Because of the lack of respects, it will take a bit of effort to do the cookie cutter thing. And the other thing is, because we're not pushing unique items as the backbone of every single build, a lot of it is based on rare items, it's actually very hard to approximate what another skilled player has come up with. So a guy who documents his public build and has a set of items that work well with it, may have people level new characters to copy the exact passive layout, but unless they really understand what he's trying to achieve by you know, having that exact set of items that they may not be able to achieve themselves, they're probably just going to be creating an inferior character. The true players are the ones who know to tweak a few skills here and there in order to get something that's appropriate for the items that they have. All right, uh, I got a question. Oh shit, I'm not. All right. I got a question about the boss fights. Will there be any sort of interesting boss fights mechanics, like in World of Warcraft, for example, where you have to walk around and step out of fire and that sort of stuff, or will it just be hold right click? That's a very good question. We're trying to make the boss fights substantially more interesting, and a good preview of the way that that's going is the Mervel fight at the end of Act 1, where there are multiple stages and minions are added to attack you. This fight is a lot more interesting than most of the other boss fights as they stand in the game at the moment, just because we haven't finished them yet. I mean, as you say, for example, Hillock and Brutus are both hold right-click type of fights, that we do have a lot of plans for how to make those more interesting that aren't finished yet. With regard to the example of the World of Warcraft raid encounters, it would be great to add more playability to these boss fights, though I don't think we're going to do it in exactly the same way that World of Warcraft is doing. It'll just be it'll be more appropriate for an action RPG setting. So we do want the players to have to change tactics during the fight and have interesting stuff happen. Okay. Will items be bound to the player, like bind on equip or bind on pickup? Bind on we will never have any type of binding, apart from potentially quest items, but that's not really something that's relevant to the question, I guess. Alright, how long will it take to create a really good item from, like, how, how long will it take to customize your item the way you want it? That question is all about how good you actually want it to be. I mean, you can get a top 60 top 60% or top 50% item that does what you want, but the numbers aren't quite as high as you'd like them to be, relatively easily. You know, you can reroll a rare to the point where it has the right kind of mods on it, but they're not high enough yet. That's not too bad. You know, we've made it so that all the mods are relatively accessible, just you get low values on them unless you're pretty lucky. So we do want it that if the guy has some boots, he wants fast run speed, and he wants some fire resistance, and he wants, um, you know, additional life on the boots. He can get boots that do that, but the perfect boots that are just right for him, that have numbers substantially higher, are going to take a very long time to get. So we'd like it that a player can build a skeleton of his build. There's just a huge amount of improvement in each item. And although it may sound unfun that we're making it purposefully hard to get perfect items, you know, I mean, realistically, it's going to be years, hopefully, before anyone gets a truly perfect item. This is an important part of the long-term appeal of the game, knowing that what you have is great and other people will appreciate it, but it's still possible to get slightly better is something that pushes you forward to keep trying to find items. All right. Um, you keep mentioning the word grind. Will the game be easy or, like, will it just be a long grind or will there actually be challenges put to the player? Well, the use of the word grind is basically describing the gameplay that occurs once they have finished the story and are playing the game for the long term, we refer to as the grind. However, I really hope it doesn't have the negative connotations that you, know, you may be attributing to it. We do, we do create the game to be fun moment to moment. In fact, one of the things we're changing with the next patch is trying to make it so that... Um, sorry, it's trying to make it so that like moment-to-moment -moment monster grinding is actually far less grindy than it is right now. We have a few balance concerns with the current version. Some of the higher difficulties take too long to kill monsters, so we're pushing the disparity between normal monsters and the bosses so that you can play and feel relatively powerful at higher difficulties killing the normal monsters, but then you have to really think about the boss encounters. 
the other thing is in terms of addiction it's very important that the game is built around the concept of having random rewards random rewards versus constant rewards this means that although you may be repeating the same actions of killing monsters you're getting stimulated in an addictive way i guess it's the skinner box scenario you're finding hey, items constantly up. that make it interesting it's not just a I mean, it would be a grind if you were killing monsters and just gaining experience and gold, and you have to do it for another four hours before you get your next reward. Whereas in Path of Exile, you could get that amazing rare item immediately. And finally, the last point here is, we have a huge amount of randomization in the levels that people are playing through. Even if they're repeating the mudflats 20 times to level up for some reason, at least it's different every time. There's different layouts of monsters and abilities on them. The level itself has surprises that occur very occasionally. All right. Uh, what was some of your main inspirations when creating the world of uh, Path of Exile or the universe in terms of books and, or movies, that kind of stuff? This question would be better suited to our lead artist, but I believe he's a big fan of H.P. Lovecraft's universe, and Mike Magnolia, I think, the guy who made the Hellboy comic, was a huge inspiration to him. However, he could answer that question a lot better, but he's not here right at the moment. All right. Um, what made you decide on the current skill tree system rather than a standard one like in Diablo 2 for example. The items basically. We knew that we wanted to have it so that the skills could be found and traded. Just the feeling of finding a skill that no one else has got and knowing that you're the only guy that can cast say Apocalypse in the game world and that you can then trade this for entire characters worth of stuff because you're that lucky or you can just show off the ability to cast that skill. It's that kind of feeling that we want to promote by having skills on items rather than just a tree that you can select in the user interface. It also fits quite a lot with the materialistic cutthroat nature of this world. The skill gems are somewhat essential to the plot of the game, even though this isn't apparent yet in Act 1 and Act 2, and hence it's important that they're on items. All Spoilers. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. So, uh, will there be mercenaries or companions? We haven't announced any plans for that yet, but the answer is yes. <laughs> we haven't announced it yet, but yes. All right. Um, a couple more questions, I guess. Uh, are there any plans for an expanded universe based on Path of Exile and Breaklast? For example, novels or comic books? That would be really awesome, but for the moment we're going to finish making the game first. <laughs> once, we're re once we're really successful, that's the type of thing I'm sure the guys would love to do. <laughs> so, what are the three things that makes... Path of Exile stand out from the other action RPGs out there? I may have already answered bits of this earlier, but the first thing I would say is the fact that it's played on online servers. I mean, if you're the type of guy that enjoyed playing Diablo 2 on Battle.net a long time ago, and you're looking for that same type of experience again in terms of playing and accumulating items and having a community online, then there are very few games that will actually let you do that nowadays. So we really want to hit that thing. Secondly, the art style, the dark visceralness of it, the fact there were pools of blood everywhere. This is something that makes people take the game seriously, we hope. I mean, it's hard to get excited about the items you're finding when they look like cartoon items. So that's the second point. Thirdly, we've just tried so hard to get visceral combat in there. I mean, th there's so much effort goes into making the moment-to-moment the -moment gameplay of it actually as fun as we can get, and I hope we improve this a lot in the future, but I would hope that the actual action gameplay is something that stands out among some of the other games in this genre. All right. When it comes to cosmetic items, will they remain um, like true to the art style, or will they be more like silly stuff like Team Fortress 2? That's actually a very good question, and it's something we discuss a lot in-house. We can't compromise the art style for the cosmetic items, but I'm sure we can find ways of making things interesting without standing out in the world as just silly. All right. Are there any other leagues besides Hardcore and Cutthroat that... Uh... Are there any other leagues? I think we've also announced an attrition league, which is a mode where you, for example, have a six hour competition, but every half an hour, the bottom few players are going to get eliminated from the ladder. So this means that there's a reason to stay playing if you can just keep ahead of the guys just directly below you. But of course, there are plenty of other league modes coming that we haven't announced yet. All right. Um, I don't know, uh, what are your opinions on the uh, Diablo 3 real money auction house? I can see why it is that they did what they did. I just think 
this would not be an appropriate thing for Path of Exile to have. I mean, we're an indie developer that has to have... We have to rely on people liking us in order to be successful. We can't take risks like that with our company, and that's why we'd much prefer to put things in the hands of the players in terms of leaving the game up to them and not try to not try to interfere in that way. All right. I uh, guess we're about done with taking some nice questions. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we quit? Well, I'd, I'd like to thank everyone for the support and interest in the game. It's We're really humbled at the office to see all these people you know, interested in our product, and we're really sorry you can't all play the beta just yet. I mean, there's a queue, 100,000 people who we haven't been able to let into the beta, and you guys will get your turn. We're going to increase the rate that we're adding people over the next few months. We're going to have everyone in by early next year. All right. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Chris. Not a problem. Thank you very much for your time, too, and thanks to the listeners. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Make sure to check out uh, pathofexile.com and yeah, sign up for the beta if you haven't, I guess. Make that queue a little bit longer. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks.